Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to be talking about the roles of legal teams and advisors, and I appreciate to this room, you're all thinking, this, great, this is the moment I can turn off, check my BlackBerry, see if there's any messages coming in, see if there's anything I've missed. But what we hope to do is unpackage what might you think to be the obvious question. What does a legal team do? But more importantly, how can you get the most out of your legal team? This panel brings together a wealth of experience. Uh, I have Bethan Onions from Arup, who's general counsel, so he's going to give a very client-faced view of the matter. Leonie Sellers, who is at Fennec Elliott, who's going to look at it from a solicitor in private practice. Uh, Damien James is going to give us the expert perspective, and I'm going to sit at the top of the tree in my ivory tower because I'm counsel, and that's obviously all that we ever do, as everyone always knows. So the structure, just so you know where we're going, we're going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about what or how we see our roles within a legal team. And then what we've tried to do, we've distilled our 50 <coughs> odd years of combined experience, that's mostly me to be fair, uh, into 10 tips or 10 takeaways, things that we've sat down and talked about at some length to try and distill how you can make your legal team work for you and how to get the best out of your legal team. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name's Bethan, as Anna said. Um, I'm in-house at Arup and I look after our focus markets, which is India, Middle East, Africa, um, and international development. Um, I like to, well, I don't like to describe my role <laughs> as paralegal to partner. So um, I, I was just saying to Mark earlier, I spend a lot of time looking at NDAs. I look, look at a lot of contracts, uh, setting up negotiations and then carrying it all the way through the project life cycle um, and to close uh, either sort of everyone's happy and we tie a ribbon around it or some people are unhappy and we need to then look at um, options for resolving issues that arise on projects. Um, so it involves a lot of working with the people that you see up on, on, on the on the podium here and as well as um, you know my partners in the business and lots of other people in the industry as well. Uh, Leonie, do you want to tell us what we do? You do. Uh, I, I, what we do. What we do. Yeah. Clearly nothing technical, judging by my skills and telling on a microphone. So my name's Leonie Sellers, I'm at Fennec Elliott, and I specialise in construction disputes. So my role will be slightly different from Bethan's in the fact that I am more specialised. Um, I don't do absolutely everything, thank goodness, because I don't think I can manage that. Um, all I do day in, day out is essentially construction disputes. Um, on a dispute, you'll lar largely have a range of solicitors, and there'll be a team, depending on the value, and we all essentially have different roles. But but the leading solicitor is essentially, like to be really nerdy and put it into construction terms, like the project manager of the dispute. They will manage various facets of that and kind of keep the teams ticking along, essentially. Uh, thanks, Anna, um, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Damien James. I'm a practicing delay and quantum expert, um, and I invariably work internationally, sort of across Africa, the Middle East, and the UK. Um, my background is as a quantity surveyor, um, and the 33 years of climbing in and out of manholes and up and down tower scaffolds, which now gives me the rights and the privilege to give opinion evidence, mostly in international arbitrations. Um, my, my role is basically to, to give opinion on the evidence which is available and the information that's available, and it's to give an impartial um, opinion to the tribunal to, to assist them in deciding matters and the outcomes of various different disputes. Uh, so that leaves me. I'm counsel. Um, that means I obviously like wearing wigs and dressing up. But for my day job, um, no, seriously, I specialise in construction insurance. Uh, I am a senior junior, that means I deal with fairly large disputes now, having sort of earned my, uh, earned, earned my badges going up through the years. I think there's a really important thing to dispel straight away. I think there is, um, not amongst the lawyers, but certainly amongst cl clients, some view that counsel is somehow a better lawyer than a solicitor. It's like we're the better ones. That's nonsense. We are a completely different skill set. 
in the States, uh, in Australia, various other places, you have a combined profession. So advocates, solicitors do both sides of, of the job that we have to do. The, the project management that Leonie's talking about, but the on-your-feet advocacy that I do. My job is presenting and knowing how to present a case in court, and everything I do is driven to that. How am I going to put your arguments over to the tribunal or the judge to make a decision? So it's a, it's a very different job to the job that Leonie does, but in doing that job, I will work with Leonie, I'll work with Bethan as a, as a client, with Damien, together to work out how we are going to put this case forward. Um, so my job is really looking at the end game. How am I going to play this case out? So I'm, if Leonie's the, the, the project manager, uh, and in some respects, I'm the gobby chap in the meetings that nobody likes. That's fundamentally my job. But I have to step back and work out how gobby I'm going to be from an early stage. So it's more like a 3D chess is what I'm looking at in terms of my game. So that's all our backgrounds. So what we're going to do, as I say, is we, we've tried to <coughs> distill all our experience, which I'm now look, thinking is probably more closer on 70 years, um, into 10 top tips. Uh, Leonie and Bethan are looking much better than I am on it. Damien, we're the haggard ones. So we're going to start with uh, Leonie, who's going to talk about her first top tip, which is flexibility. Thank you. So everything I'm going to say sounds really, really obvious, but no two disputes are the same, so you really need to remain flexible. And that is kind of encompassing several areas. So technically, no two disputes are the same. They'll all involve different areas, so your approach has to change. Procedurally, they'll be different. So obviously, an ICC dispute will be just different from a DIAC dispute, but also your tribunal will be different. So what lands with that tribunal member will be different from another tribunal member, or what they've procedurally set out will be different from that. So therefore, your strategy needs to change for every dispute. So as a client or as a solicitor, you have to approach that dispute and kind of think you can't put any kind of preconceptions into that. Everything needs to change. You need to be quite light on your feet. You need to be able to remain flexible, essentially, throughout that dispute. And also, as the dispute grows, you need to remain flexible. So the advice that I would give to clients will be different on day one as it will be a week away from the hearing. It will change, it will evolve. So you just have to remain flexible throughout that and your approach needs to change throughout. That's tip one. Uh, step two, it sounds, it sounds like strictly now, isn't it? Step two, uh, Damien, who's going to talk about the importance of crystallizing matters. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Anna. Um, I think, obviously, it's important in terms of um, crystallising our disputes and exactly what we are discussing, what, exactly what we want to take to an arbitration process. Um, and that, that comes about sometimes because the project that we're involved in might not necessarily have identified what the dispute is. And, you know, when you look at this in terms of the investigation and the telling the, the correct story in an arbitration proceedings or as an expert, um, you're looking for the washer that caused the wheel to fall off the plane and caused the plane to crash. Um, doing that, obviously, isn't, a, isn't necessarily the, the excess... Um, reassessment of everything. Sometimes there are common grounds and there are issues which are in play that are easily agreeable between parties. But then there are other issues which are the merits and the entitlement. And then we're, what we've got to look at then is the strength and weaknesses of both those positions. Um, it's not so much a SWOT analysis, but it's the realisation that our strengths are the weaknesses of the other side. The weak, our weak, the weaknesses that we have are the strengths of the other side too. Um, so. Not, not so much a Scott schedule, but looking at those from a bullet point and analysis, being able to discuss that, and then being able to frame that from the position of who's best to deal with each of these issues. Now, when it's technical, it might be that the expert is the right person to deal with it, but it's not always necessary that it's the, the delay and the quantum expert. We might need another expert in the process. Um, similarly, there might be issues of, of law, which the, the lawyers and the and counsel's more, more adept at dealing with. And then there might be factual issues, and we need to find the witnesses, etc bring them back in. And often the case is that the most crystallised of disputes are the, the combination of all three. And I think that's the focus, getting to what's crystallised, being able to deal with it and be able to address it properly. So once you've crystallised your issues, which we've all made sound incredibly easy, uh, but of course actually what it is is many, many hours of sitting down going, what the heck are we doing and why are we here? 
Once you've identified what you think the questions are that you're going to deal with, that starts, uh, enables you to start planning your strategy. So you've got crystallized questions, but then you've got to think about, well, do I know the answers to them? And particularly, I think, with clients, in terms of the legal team, sometimes the framing of the question is what can throw your client off. Why are you asking this question? Why do you want to know that? Why do you want that bit of paper? Why do I have to show you this? Why are you asking me that? And of course, what we're trying to do is get the information we need to, to plan a strategy. So if you've got a question, the next thing that follows is an answer. If you've got your answer, can you start to identify what the range of outcomes is? Because the, the, the only thing a client really wants to know, understandably, am I going to win and how much is it going to cost me to get there? That's the nub of a legal dispute from a client's perspective. And as a legal team, it's our obligation to try and answer that. But we can't answer that without planning strategy. And strategy is, of course, question-driven, the crystallization of questions, as Damien said, and the way we get there. But then we have to find the answers. Uh, and that can be the hardest task is stepping back and looking at what the most effective route is. But I also think it's a, it's a stage that can often get overlooked in the, the rough and tumble of getting towards a hearing, because you've got your statement of case out. You, you, you're then looking at your defense. You're then drafting up your red fern. You're then getting to your expert reports. And stepping back at each point in the case and going, right, what's our strategy? Are we following it? It sounds obvious. You'd be surprised how many times you lose those moments just to stop and breathe and think about whether you're heading in the right direction. And it really goes back to what Leonie was saying, her role is. You can never forget the importance of project management in a litigation dispute. It's all it is in some respects. You're building something. You're building your case. And exactly the same way as you will have a program to get you on a project from day one to your PC certificate, a dispute's the same. We're going from notice of arbitration or, or statement of case or claim form or whatever dispute form we're in to award to judgment. That's your PC certificate. And you've just got to plan your strategy along the way. And things will come up, we know that but you've got to keep your eye on your strategy, which is effectively, let's be blunt about it, your critical path to get you through. Just because it's litigation, don't forget the skills that you've already got, which are hardwired into construction. Actually, for us as lawyers, construction disputes are sometimes the easiest to do in terms of client relationships, because construction understands a timeline to get to an end in a way that commercial matters quite often don't. So use your strengths to help your legal team, I would say. So um, next one, I, I see I, I'm just going to introduce this one. Horses for courses. There are a lot of ways, or several ways, I should say, in which a legal team can evolve and can come into being. And it's quite useful to think about it and look at it. Uh, and we thought that might just be interesting in terms of perspectives from the way that we see legal teams being formed. And I think, Damien, you're going to start off on the getting out of a manhole. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, climbing out of the manhole, that has been the story of my life. Um, I had two notes for this. One was horses and the other one was cats. And I'm not sure whether horses for courses and um, there's numerous ways to skin a cat are quite appropriate these days, but they, they were my reminder points for this here. Um, obviously, from, from this session, one of the, the key takeaways is the selection of a legal team. And I think from, from my perspective, obviously, yes, we, we all take references from different sessions such as this and from LinkedIn and from marketing, etc. But when, in terms of the coal face, the, the position that I'm often faced with is that I'll have a client that I've possibly worked for before. Now, bearing in mind most of my appointments come from um, lawyers or attorneys in Africa, um, I do get approached by um, contractors or subcontractors or employers. And they confront me with a thousand pieces of paper, a thousand documents, and they say, tell us what you think, tell us what, what, what we're going to do with this. And it's almost as if they want me to say that everything you did was correct and go back to the employer or the party that's not paying them and tell them it's correct. I'm the expert, I've just told you it's correct. That isn't, that isn't the case. I mean, we've talked about the 
the flexibility approach and, and the crystallization of the, the, the disputes. It's looking at those disputes from two different phases, two different necessary stages, looking at them, seeing what you can see, being able to define them, being able to look at them correctly. But from that point, there's a selection process then for the legal team, which the party has to engage in. And from my consideration, I'm almost feeding back into what do I think is the best approach for a client in that situation. So it, it may be that um, the last lawyer is the, the friendliest lawyer I've worked with and I want to work with them again, but it may be that you need a specific type of lawyer. It may be that you want to um, recommend a specific type of counsel. Not that you can necessarily influence all those decisions, but building that team on behalf of a client or a contractor or a subcontractor who places their trust in you is, is an important process. Um, so often I'll undertake one or two different stages in the process. It might be an 80-20 rule, it might be a desktop modeling, or it might be something that says, look, we have merits and entitlement here, and what we need is the legal team involved, and that's early, early decisions. Uh Bethan, do you want to, to give us insight from your side of things as general counsel as your approach to forming a legal team or creating a legal team? Picking up on that point that um, Damien mentioned earlier about bringing together who he wants to work with. What happens in a dispute, from my perspective, is that I'll get a call on a Friday afternoon. Um, <clears throat> Friday afternoon, South Africa time, which means I'm probably well into uh, my evening here um, and there's a problem of a setting out issue on site that's arisen and the client's not very happy what do we do about it so it's all about how do we manage <clears throat> internally that process who do we need to talk to who do i need to get onto the on the phone um, and bring in from my side to make sure that we're looking at it properly if it if it's a sort of um, small fee claim, do I need to start calling Leonie, do I need to start calling Anna, or do I just need to get the papers and have a look at it myself, sit down with that project manager, project director. Um, if it's something that looks quite big, and it's going to be big from the outset, then we need to sort of think about it more widely and get those people on the call um, <clears throat> in the room as soon as possible, because I think one of the things that I'll I will probably say time and time again is setting out your strategy at the beginning and sort of taking that step back to understand who it is you're, you're working with can really help if you put the sort of time and effort in the beginning to identify the right people from an internal perspective um, in, in the business, not just the external team that's supporting you as well. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Leonie, um, tell us about being a I was going to say puppet master, but I'll say project manager instead. <coughs> yeah, so <laughs> when, as Bethany gets her kind of Friday afternoon call, I get my Friday evening call <laughs> from the client. Uh, we're slightly panicked. Um, and then we sit down and, and we start just strategizing and trying to figure out about building a team. And that team will vary, again, depending on what the dispute is. And this is kind of like our crystal ball moment, essentially, as, as a, a project manager or puppet master or whatever, and I wants to refer to me as. So I may obviously look at the matter and think we need to bring counsel on board, we need to bring an expert on board as it kind of evolves. That is about trusting the legal team to be doing their job properly, but it's also about clients having faith to say, what about this, what about that, and for those views to be taken account of. Sorry, it also becomes a bit of a cost management point as well. So you can have the best legal team in the world and the best experts on board, but you don't necessarily need everyone involved in every stage. A client doesn't want to pay for absolutely everything. They shouldn't have to pay for absolutely everything. So a good no. solicitor needs to manage the costs of that. You know, I might need to bring Anna on board hypothetically on a case, and that doesn't necessarily mean you need to sit there through every single con with the client. Now, it might be necessary for you to be on that. I can look at that and think, actually, probably better that you hear this directly. But we'll look at that and think, is that something I can actually do with a 15-minute call with you separately afterwards and save costs in that respect? So it's about kind of juggling that as well and making sure that you're not overcharging the client, not bringing too many people on board at once um, for, for things that's not entirely necessary. 
So one of the things we've sort of really tried to um, get to grips with over the uh, over the kind of past few years in, within Arab is ownership from an internal perspective. So you know we've just heard about who forms the team, and actually the ownership of that sort of can change from an external team perspective depending on the pr part of the process in which you find yourself. Um, but what we need to remember um, as clients is that client ownership is is paramount. We can't just hand stuff over. Over, um, to our internal counsel or external counsel, and walk away and say, "Well, that you know, here's my thousand pages of documents, Damien. Can you go and fix it for me? I'm going to go um, and have a, a lie down now, um, <laughs> whatever it is." Um, and you know. Um, especially in the context of larger claims, um, when we're looking at insurers being involved, they want to know that it's being properly run from an internal perspective. Um, we're also very, you know, much more focused on not just the financial implications of matters now, but reputational impact. And if you don't know your business, um, and with the best will in the world, as long as our relationships have, have been standing, you know, an external partner will not know what the main, the, the fundamental drivers are to that level of extent from a relationship, um, reputational perspective. So that's a really important one that's sort of really climbing up the agenda at the moment. Um, and it ensures if you've got a proper owner within the business that adequate attention is being given to that matter and you're working hand in hand with the project manager, external solicitor, or internal um, legal function if, if it doesn't pop out, um, to make sure that you're tracking against you know, your strategy that you've set in partnership with your team at the beginning. Um, and one of the things we've sort of done within Arup is set up this major claims protocol. So anything that we deem to be a major claim, and that's from a kind of uh, an amount perspective, a technical perspective, a reputational perspective, is um, given a major claims director and also a steering group. And so what those sort of people are responsible for are setting the strategy, tracking against the strategy, and taking away some of the... Um, sort of day-to-day -day stress that the project team would otherwise have to deal with, who wouldn't necessarily be as objective in their approach to, to the matters as they might be, which can get in the way, of, we can get in the way of ourselves when we're doing that. So that's a big part of sort of our ownership strategy of claims, any claim, but in particular major claims. And in terms of ownership, and you touched on, on insurers, the one thing I think a lot of clients miss is if there's not that engagement from a client side, uh, insurers can get understandably a little bit upset about it and think you're not cooperating. Uh, and if you don't want to get into a non-cooperating position with your insurer, because they might think they're going to put you, they might decide to pull cover on you because you're not holding up your side of the bargain. Which brings me to Damien, who's going to talk about what I think one of the most important issues. Uh, in terms of a team, which is building trust. And again, we talk about the, the sort of utopia almost of um, DABs and tribunals in terms of the, the lawyer who sits as the chair and the, 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 the technical expert, the delay and quantum chap, and maybe an architect or an engineer. That, that's the harmonized blend that you are effectively looking for in your team. And, and obviously with that comes the trust issues of trusting each other. Um, the easy separation for me is between merits and entitlement. Um, and obviously when we get to numbers, it's, it's about being able to listen, to your expert and, and trust your expert in respect to those numbers that you don't want to hear. Um, you know, a good expert will be able to tell you that early in the process, um, or they may be able to raise various challenges that help the process and help you get over the issues that arise in terms of getting to the best entitlement you can possibly get to. Um, so I, th I think it's important to to accept challenges from each other. I think it's important to stress test the issues that we raise, um, and also sanity ch sanity check them as well. I mean, you know, let's let's not go down go down the line of something which offends the personalities later on and, and has absolutely no benefit in the process just because we thought, it, you know, we were we were engaged in a vengeful process. You know, that's important not to do as well. So, um, and then obviously within a team, 
when you when you have trust, we see it in, we see it with, with sporting events and the best sporting teams. Yes, they may have some conflict, but not conflict which is negative. Conflict which is positive and brings the best out of each other. And I think once you get that trust model, accepting of personalities, accepting of what your role is, without crossing into different areas, unless you are capable of making something which is, you know. Um, of benefit and is a, is, a, is, a, is a challenge for the likes of um, Anna at council or, or the lawyers in the team, then, you know, resist it and do it correctly, trust in the process and trust in each other. I think one thing I think clients sometimes miss, Damien, um, what would be interested in your view, is that your duty is to the tribunal and not to the person who's paying your bill. But that means you've got to do your best to get the right answer and get the right information. How, how do you find that that sometimes goes down with, with clients in terms of extracting information? Um, I think it, it's difficult with clients because they are, are the person paying you and they always feel like they're paying for a service. So um, early information in that respect in terms of your overriding duty to the tribunal and, or to the arbitrator or to an adjudicator, whoever you before even the courts, it's, it's important and, and allowing them to understand that process. Um, it, it's very much founded on information that's available. It's very much founded on the factual witness information which often plugs the gaps and that, that's part of that team process in, in, in ensuring that happens. Bethan, in terms of building trust, um, obviously starts at the beginning and goes to the end. Do you want to talk to us about timeline? Um, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> I think um, forgive me for repeating ourselves, but essentially we look at this like a project, um, like the project that is sort of generating the dispute. So it's really important that you sort of have a look at your program, set your program from the outset and understand what the key milestones are along the way. Um, it's important that we are um, and, and again, going back to your trust point and the challenge point, we know that during that process, the sort of importance of team members will ebb and flow. Um, and some people will think they're much more important throughout the process. Don't know about you, but council often think that. Um, uh, but that's not always the case. Um, and at the, at the outset of your program, it's super important that you get the client in the room, you get all the information, you get as much as you can at that point, and then you know, in-house or external counsel can start to mar uh, marshal that information, and you're hitting your milestones along the way. Your deliverables are slightly different to um, council's deliverables. But that's, that's a really key part of this ownership, strategy, trust, is having your program, um, being flexible with it because, you know, people might not turn up, things, uh, things like that do happen occasionally, uh, and, and being able to manage how, how that kind of impacts your timeline and your program. Um, but it is, it is fundamental.